You're exploring the echoing marble halls. Statues tower above you, and cold water covers your bare feet. The whole room, the whole labyrinth, smells like rain. Your guide is a strange man. His hair, adorned with all sorts of seashells, jingles as he walks. He beams as he shows you around. Later, he'll write this in his diary. We continued on our way, stopping often to admire a particularly striking statue. Our hearts grew lighter again, and when we reached the coral halls, we refreshed ourselves with looking at their wonders. Though the coral halls are dry now, it appears that at one time they were flooded with seawater for a long period. Coro has grown there, changing the statues in strange and unexpected ways. One may see, for example, a woman crowned with coro, her hands transformed into stars or flowers. There are figures horned with coro, or crucified on coro branches, or stuck through with coro arrows. There is a lion enmeshed in a cage of coral, and a man holding a little box. The coral has grown so profusely over his left side that half of him appears to be engulfed in red and rose-colored flames, while the other half is not. Ah, coral partially covering a marble statue. It looks like red and rose-colored flames. I believe this passage was written as a treat for people like me, people with very visual imaginations. I can see it with my mind's eye. I can see not only the statue, but I can see through this character's eyes and, and feel how he got to the idea of frozen fire while looking at the coral. And I find it wonderful. And please break down this word with me. Wonderful, full of wonder. There were thousands of different ways to describe this exact same scene. But this one, this one made me stop my bicycle, rewind my audiobook, and listen again. That's the magic of poetics. If the character had said, I found the statue covered in corals wonderful, or even if the book had addressed me directly and said, You, reader, experience wonder right now. That wouldn't have worked. Emotions cannot be commanded like that. They need to be evoked, lured, enticed out of the reader. And the tool to do just that is poetics. Today we're gonna explore poetics by delving into Susanna Clarke's Piranesi. This book touched me profoundly. This mysterious world that she created combined with this beautiful language that she crafted to talk about it. Ah, it filled me with my favorite emotion of them all. The one emotion I have dedicated my writing to and in many ways dedicated my life to. Wonder. Let's explore how she got there. Let's talk about poetics. Do you want to create worlds that will make people gasp and wonder and ponder and tear up? Great! Me too! And that's the whole point of this series of videos here, The World Building Tower. In each video, I bring a lesson from a great piece of media, a wonderful book, a wonderful movie, a wonderful game, and together we explore this lesson and then there's an exercise that me and you can try our hands and create new worlds. And then maybe when we create a thousand of those, we'll get good at it. This, this is what I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> this channel is growing and it's a lovely thing to see. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm still in pre-fetus numbers for YouTube standards, but still, every single new subscriber puts a smile on my face. If it's your first time here, consider subscribing if you're interested in world building, if you're interested in poetics. Thank you so much for your support.
asked, why are some books electric, volcanic, while others don't even stir you? Ah, that's poetics. In one case, the poetics touched you, in the other, it didn't. And I'm not talking about poetry here, but I'm talking about one element that's at the crux of poetry. Imagine there's an anti-poetic style of writing, something that's actively avoiding provoking any emotions. Uh, maybe it's describing something like a, a patent document, or maybe it's a step-by-step -step sequence of actions like a, a police report. Now imagine the absolute opposite of this, a style of writing that is not trying to describe reality, it's not trying to tell a story whatsoever, it's just trying to provoke pure raw emotion, something even more abstract than Frank O'Hara's poems. Yeah, more abstract than that. Literature, all literature, lives in the middle. Fine, maybe non-fiction has other rules, but the sentence was less catchy. <laughs> If you're writing a fantasy book, you're describing a world, you're describing characters and what they're interacting with, you're telling a story, one action after the other. But as you describe this world, you're using poetics to make your readers feel things. That's why your book doesn't sound like an instruction manual. Poetics are present in both the language you're choosing to use, the, the words you're choosing, the order, the rhythm they create together, but also in the metaphors, the allegories, the themes and images you're choosing to portray. When Piranesi talks about the coral halls, we appreciate the subject of this admiration, the statues with Koro are a powerful vision, but we also appreciate the language that's used to convey this admiration. Novels are not only dryly describing universes, they are carefully conducting you from one emotion to the next. And that's what I'm interested in. As a reader, I want you, the writer, to expertly guide my emotional state. I want to see how you do it, your unique way to play me like a fiddle. But poetics are elusive, slippery. Many times when I felt I had finally gripped an author's poetic style and beauty, I opened my hands just to find them empty. And it's not as if the beauty had dissolved in my clasp, it's as if it was never there to begin with. I like to believe it didn't just vanish, it went somewhere, somewhere inside of me. Not a practical, easy to reach spot, not my mind's nightstand, but somewhere in the dark catacombs of me. Glimmering caverns encrusted with all the gorgeous ideas I've been collecting over the years. All I need to do is to journey there, to allow my writing to draw from the deep halls, the places that are hard to find, labyrinthic even. This is not the domain of the conscious mind anymore, of calculating decisions and pros and cons. This is the black foamed ocean of the unconscious mind. And for a writer like me, this is where the magic happens. Below the surface, where all rational noise is muffled. It's true that not all writers write the same way. Maybe your pattern is different, and that's okay. Everybody brings a different gift to the table. Everybody carries a different piece of the puzzle. But in this video here, I want to address all the writers like me, writers who rely heavily on the unconscious mind. Writers that can only perform magic when they leap into the dark pit without knowing if there's anything at the bottom. Here lies an educational challenge. How to teach poetics then? How to learn? I could fool myself here, perhaps even I could fool you, I could talk about the distance between punctuation or the percentages between nouns and verbs and adverbs and sentences, or even talk about the frequency of metaphors and comparisons. And the pattern-seeking parts of my brain would find such patterns. It is all it does. It's very developed. Upon seeing those patterns, upon agreeing with me that they exist, you might go, aha, 
That's the key. That's the key to beauty. Let's just cut the adverbs and use this amount of commas or whatnot. Then we'd write something using the golden rules we just uncovered. And it would, most likely, be damp rubbish. Why? Because we focused on the wrong thing. We didn't focus on the real important stuff. We focused on the thing that was easiest to focus. The true fairy spring inside of us remained untapped. This is something I have to grapple with often in my creative work. I need to ask myself the same question over and over again. Am I paying attention to this? Just because paying attention to this is easy. I know that my best plot lines and my best sentences and my best dialogues don't come from an analytical attitude. They come from love, despair, wonder. Okay, 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 but this begs the question. If it's not through rational pattern seeking, then how to learn poetics? Truth is, I don't know. This channel here is not an expert trying to convey all the precious knowledge that was gathered through years of study. No, 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 no. I am just somebody who cares a lot about art, who thinks a lot about art, who gives this attention and time and passion, and who wants to get better. This, this is all I am. I'm doing my best, okay? I'm only bringing here the stuff that I believe is really good. But I am experimenting. I'm a seeker. So here's the experiment I'm bringing today. A take on how to get better at poetics without relying on rational pattern seeking. This is a technique I'm calling fine dining with the monster. Here's the basic idea. Your unconscious mind is dealing with everything that pops up in your life. And its behavior is mysterious to the conscious mind. The monster who lives inside of you is eating everything, everything. So what will the monster remember when you're making art? I don't know. But here's the thing that I found out in both my writing journey, but also making this YouTube channel here. There's a real difference between reading a paragraph for the first time, let's say while you're reading a novel or a longer piece of writing, and coming back to the same paragraph later to give it more attention, to bask in its sun. If you've been following this channel, you've been following my selection of passages that I, I bring here to look at them with more attention, more time, more care. I tend to remember those passages much better. They tend to pop up fairly often when I'm editing my own writing as comparisons and inspirations. To me, it feels like I stopped just feeding the monster and I took the monster to some fine dining. I'm not giving it a lot of food, in fact I'm giving it very little, but I'm also telling the monster this flavor, this texture, pay attention to each point, savor this paragraph. It's a severe change of attitude. I could read 10 paragraphs instead of one, but I'm choosing to spend my time with that one. I'm opening my heart to that little piece of writing. I selected that bit. This is the bit of the novel I want to keep forever. Now I want to enjoy every single letter. I want to revel in its nuances. I'm not breaking it down. I am not trying to understand. I am trying to feel. And I'm trying to tell my body, remember, remember how this feels. And I do that by approaching the piece of writing with reverence and curiosity. Then reading it very calmly, enjoying all of its cadences. And at the end, closing my eyes and feeling how good that was. Oh, monster who lives inside of me, I just sent you the finest of meals. Please enjoy, please remember. And this attitude is what we're going to practice right now. Besides the one I already used for the intro, I've selected two extra passages from Piranesi, both short, beautiful, and very 
world building heavy. I want you to feel this world with your guts. Allow those paragraphs to live inside of you, to thrive inside of you. <laughs> Ready? Let's start where we left, with some statues. The two statues flank the eastern door of the first western hall. They are approximately six meters tall and have two unusual features. Firstly, they are much larger than the other statues in the first western hall. Secondly, they are incomplete. Their trunks emerge from the wall at their waists. Their arms reach back to push mightily. Their muscles swell with the effort and their faces are contorted. They are not comfortable to contemplate. They seem to be in pain, struggling to be born. The struggle may be fruitless, and yet they do not give up. Their heads are extravagantly horned, and so I have named them the Horned Giants. They represent endeavor and the struggle against the wretched fate. That's some nice writing. I want to write like that. <laughs> I can see the statues, their shapes make me feel uneasy. My body suddenly feels wrenched. And yet, they are gorgeous in the stony struggle. My mind fills in the gaps and I can see the static muscles close to the limits of their effort. And I get a glimpse of the main character as he interprets the scene in front of him, his surveying eyes soaking everything. And talking about main character, let's explore him in this next passage. But first, let me invite you to take a deep breath. Okay. Let's go. The bird sailed across the heaving waves, never once beating its wings. With great skill and ease, it tipped itself slightly sideways to pass through the doorway that separated us. Its wingspan surpassed even the width of the door. I knew what it was, an albatross. Still it continued, straight towards me, and the strangest thought came to me. Perhaps the albatross and I were destined to merge, and the two of us would become another order of being entirely an angel. This thought both excited and frightened me, but still I remained, arms outstretched, mirroring the albatross's flight. My heart beat rapidly. The moment that he reached me, the moment that I thought we would collide like planets and become one, I gave out a sort of gasping cry. Ah! In the same instant, I felt some sort of pent-up tension go out of me, a tension I did not know I had until that moment. Vast white wings passed over me. I felt and smelt the air those wings brought with them. The sharp, salty, wild tang of faraway tides, and winds that had roamed vast distances through halls I would never see. At the last moment, the albatross swung over my left shoulder. I fell to the pavement. He flapped his wings in a frantic, panicked sort of way, stuck out his wiry pink legs and tumbled out of the air into a sort of heap on the pavement. In the air, he was a miraculous being, a heavenly being, but on the stones of the pavement, he was mortal and subject to the same embarrassments and clumsiness as other mortals. Hmm... I love this. 
this romantic way to witness the world so beautifully translated into this character's way of being. This passage is lyric enough to evoke all sorts of visions and emotions and complex chemical reactions inside of me, but it's not abstract enough to make me confused about what's happening. It's all very clear. This is not poetry, this is prose with a heavy touch of poetics, but still definitely prose with this chain of actions that can be placed one after the other. And yet those actions, those events are painted in such a way that makes me feel things. I also want to fuse with the albatross and become an angel. I also want to believe in this. Now that we've spent some time with Piranesi, let's see how it can inspire us. Okay, so today's exercise reminds me of that bit at the very beginning of Portal 2 when a machine voice tells you This is art. You will hear a buzzer. When you hear the buzzer, stare at the art. You should now feel mentally reinvigorated. This is not inherently different from what we'll do. <laughs> so today's first step is to spend some time with our reference work. To stare at the art. In this case, Piranesi. Of course, you could use another book, but since I use Piranesi here in the video, I am going to spend some time with those paragraphs that I have selected. I'm just gonna give them more attention, more care than I normally would. Read slowly, with deliberation, paying attention to what happens inside of you. Which is part of our step two. Pay attention to what's happening inside of you. What are those emotions? What is steering? This is the raw emotional material that we're gonna use for our last bit. Which is, of course, to write a couple of paragraphs that use this thing that you just absorbed. Don't talk about statues, don't talk about birds, choose themes and archetypes that Piranesi didn't explore, but add some Piranesi-esque poetics to it. Of course you cannot do exactly those poetics, you can only do your poetics, but I'm inviting you to bring a little bit of that color to your practice. I know this exercise has foggier boundaries than the ones we normally do here, but hey, if video games taught me anything at all was that if you're feeling challenged, you're probably on the right track. And with that, we go to the last part of the video, which is my take on this exercise here. Not the right answer or anything, just one example out of infinite that would come from this. And I'm very excited to share some poetic flair with you folks. I had a lot of fun doing this one. And if you do the exercise and you post it in the comments below so I can read it, it, it makes my day. It, and it's even better when other world builders comment on each other's work and ask questions. It's such a lovely exchange. So feel encouraged, feel free to put your results on the comments here. Now, let's make some magic. Today's exercise is very subjective, and that's okay, writing is very subjective. Let's draw strength from this, let's accept and embody. The few guidelines I gave myself were, one, I wanted something very world building heavy, not only because the name of this series is World Building Tower, but because Piranesi's world really captivated me. But, as I encourage you to do, I also steered away from Piranesi's motifs and archetypes. Uh, I wanted something about the raw poetics of it, but I didn't want to do anything akin to fanfic work, even though that could be an interesting exercise. And, as you might have guessed, I wanted to write a scene that would provoke wonder. Are you lemony orchestral emotion? I seek you. So I read, I reread, I closed my eyes, I inspected my body, my emotional state, and a couple of hours later, I wrote this. I pressed my cheek against the floor tapestry to better observe the colony's clockwork. 
a group of four ants would hold a thick thread upwards, thus allowing their comrades to carefully insert three colored bids in a line. As soon as the bids were placed, the four holders would perform a circular choreography, delicate as a music box, weaving the thread with the rest of the tapestry and repeating the first lifting position. Their feathery bodies trembled with the effort. Pulling my head back, I could see the hundreds of little ant squadrons working in unison, as if conducted by a maestro despite the silence. My host, who had shifted his feet and tensed his shoulders when I laid on the floor, partially relaxed as I stood up again. Yet, I didn't have eyes for him. Instead, I inspected the walls. The result of that intimate coordination was monumental. As my gaze moved around, the combined glint of millions of small reflections created geometric light patterns wherever I looked. The colony was trained to always place the same order of colors, white, then lilac, then red, then blue, then lilac again, giving the room its combined shade. To the ants, it must have felt like standing on a flower field of precious stones. My eyes watered, and the beginnings of my tears reflected white, then lilac, then red, and so on. It must have taken generations upon generations of ants to cover this whole palace, I commented. Over 42 years, mistress, as of now, 28 rooms and halls are covered with the weave. This will be our 29th by the end of autumn, said my host, relieved. Talking about the phallus brought him back to his element. These creatures are magnificent, I said. He chuckled and for the first time my attention wavered from the beauty in front of me. With all due respect, mistress, there's nothing magnificent about the workers. Look, he said, as he knelt next to one of the thread squadrons and squished one of the ants with his ringed index finger. I gasped, despite myself. Look at their reaction, he said. As soon as one of the four had been brutalized, there was a scuffle among the production line. Colored beads were passed along, the body was removed, and a new ant promptly replaced the first one on the group. In seconds, they were dancing their weaving waltz again. You can't respect animals that treat their dead like this. They're just workers. Living machines, he told me. I kept my eyebrows reluctantly still. In my mind, I prayed for a colossal finger to come from the sky and crush my host into a puddle of blood on the floor's tapestry. I'd make sure not to give him a proper burial, but to remove his body matter-of-factly and promptly request another host to guide me through the palace. Mm, yep, yeah. I enjoyed writing that. It was really cool. <laughs> Curiously enough, I think this is the closest to my book that I ever posted here on the channel, so... <laughs> I also noticed some non piranesi inspirations that just popped up unprompted. I think there's something with those precious stones that comes from uh, Ursula Le Guin's The Toms of Atwan, and something about those ants that makes me think they might be akin to the ants that work inside Discworld computers. So even deliberately drawing from Piranesi, I don't think I can or that I should escape other 
poetics that came from the monster. The monster sent them up. Okay, I'll use that. <laughs> I hope you experienced at least a little bit of wonder. In that note, it's time for me to go. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and follow this community in more world building journeys. And folks, um, commenting really helps my numbers. I've been realizing even if you just comment a word to help me out, it, it does boost my numbers. So if you could do that, that would be fantastic. And a special thank you to my patrons. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you, I am humbled by your support. Thank you so much. And I'll see you folks in the next video. Bye. <laughs>